Welcome back to our course, Fundamentals of Operating Systems, based on the text Operating System Concepts, 10th edition, by Silbershots, Gagney, and Galvin, published by Wiley Publishing. This is Lesson 3. We just finished a discussion of uh, demand paging, and we are going to begin considering demand paging optimization. So let's just pick up where we left off. An additional aspect of demand paging is the handling and overall use of swap space. Now that swap space is that space on the hard disk which is used by the operating system to store data pages that are currently not needed. This swap space can be a partition as well as a swap file. Input output to swap space is generally faster than it is to the file system. It is faster because swap space is allocated in much larger blocks and file lookups and indirect allocation methods are not used. One option for the system to gain better paging throughput is by copying an entire file image into the swap space at process startup and then performing demand paging from that swap space instead of the file system. There is more overhead to this approach due to the copying of the file image at program startup. A second option, and one practiced by several operating systems including Linux and Windows, is to demand page from the file system initially, but to write the pages to swap space as they are replaced. This is working similar to the caching techniques that we discussed earlier. This approach will ensure that only needed pages are read from the file system, but that all subsequent paging is done from swap space. Some systems attempt to limit the amount of swap space used through demand paging of binary executable files. Demand pages for such files are brought directly from the file system. However, when a page replacement is called for, these frames can be overwritten because they're never modified, and the pages can be read in from the file system again if needed. Using this approach, the file system itself serves as the backing storage. However, swap space must still be used for pages not associated with a file. These pages include the stack and the heap for the process. This method appears to be a good compromise, and it's used in several systems including Linux and BSD Unix. Mobile operating systems typically do not support swapping. Instead, these systems demand page from the file system and reclaim read-only pages such as code from the applications if memory becomes constrained. One technique provides rapid process creation and minimizes the number of new pages that must be allocated to the newly created process. Remember that the fork system call creates a child process that is a duplicate of its parent? We talked about that earlier. Traditionally, fork worked by creating a copy of the parent's address space for the child duplicating the pages belonging to the parent. However, considering that many child processes invoke the exact system call immediately after creation, the copying of the parent's address space may be unnecessary. Instead, we can use a technique known as copy on write, which works by allowing the parent and the child processes initially to share the same pages. These shared pages are marked as copy on write pages, meaning that if either process writes to a shared page, a copy of the shared page is created. Copy on write is shown in the figures below, which show the contents of the physical memory before and after process 1 modifies page C.
you can see here that initially the process one and process two, or the parent and the child, are sharing page C. But when one of the processes modifies page C, a copy is then made. Assume that the child process attempts to modify a page containing portions of the stack with the pages set to be copy on write. The operating system will obtain a frame from the free frame list and create a copy of this page, mapping it to the address space of the child. The child process will then modify its copied page and not the page belonging to the parent. Obviously, when the copy on write technique is used, only the pages that are modified by either process are copied. All unmodified pages can be shared by the parent and child processes. Note too that only pages that can be modified need to be marked as copy on write. Pages that cannot be modified, pages containing executable code for example, can be shared by the parent and the child. Copy on write is a common technique used by several operating systems, including Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Several versions of Unix provide a variation of the fork system call, it's called vFork, which stands for virtual memory fork. It operates differently from the other fork with copy on write. With vFork, the parent process is suspended, and the child process uses the address space of the parent. Because vFork does not use copy on write, if the child process changes any of the parent's address space, the altered pages will be visible to the parent once it resumes. So vFork must be used with caution to ensure that the child process does not modify the address space of the parent. VFORC is intended to be used when the child process calls exec immediately after the creation. Because no copying of pages takes place, VFORC is an extremely efficient method of process creation and is sometimes used to implement Unix command line shell interfaces. When considering page fault rate, we can't assume that each page faults only once when it's first referenced. That's not necessarily true. If a process of 10 pages uses only half of them, then demand paging saves the input-output necessary to load the five pages that are never used. We already know that we can increase our degree of multiprogramming by running more processes. So if we know that five of the pages are never used, we could run eight processes with 40 frames rather than four that could run if the process required all 10 frames, including the five that are never used. If we make that assumption and increase our degree of multiprogramming, we are over-allocating memory, the way an airline over-allocates seats. If we run six processes, each of which is 10 pages in size but uses only five pages, we have higher CPU utilization and throughput with 10 frames to spare. It is possible, however, that each of these processes for a data set may try to use all 10 of its pages, resulting in the need for 60 frames when only 40 are available. Also consider that system memory is not used only for holding program pages. Buffers for input and output also consume quite a bit of memory. This use can increase the strain on memory placement algorithm, deciding how much memory to allocate to input-output and how much to program pages is a significant challenge. Some systems allocate a fixed percentage of memory to input-output buffers, whereas others allow both processes and input-output system to compete for all system memory. Overallocation of memory manifests itself as follows. While a process is executing, a page fault occurs. The operating system determines where the desired page is residing on secondary storage, but then finds that there are no free frames in the free frame list. All memory is in use. 
The situation is illustrated in this figure on the right where the fact that there are no free frames is depicted by this question mark. The operating system has several options at this point. It could terminate the process. However, demand paging is the operating system's attempt to improve the computer system's utilization and throughput. Users should not be aware that their processes are running on a page system. Paging should be logically transparent to the user, so terminating is not the best choice. The operating system could instead use standard swapping and swap out a process, freeing all of its frames and reducing the level of multiprogramming. However, standard swapping is no longer used by most operating systems due to the overhead of copying entire processes between memory and swap spaces. Most operating systems now combine swapping pages with page replacement, a technique that we're about to explore in some detail. Page replacement takes the following approach. If no frame is free, we find one that's not currently being used and free it. We can free a frame by writing its contents to swap space and changing the page table and all other tables to indicate that the page is no longer in memory, as shown in this figure on the right. We can now use the freed frame to hold the page for which the process faulted. We modify the page fault service routine to include page replacement. First, find the location of the desired page on secondary storage. Second, find a free frame. If there is a free frame, use it. If there is no free frame, use a page replacement algorithm to select a victim frame. Write the victim frame to secondary storage if necessary and change the page and frame tables accordingly. Read the desired page into the newly freed frame and change the page and frame tables. Continue the process from where the page fault occurred. Notice that if no frames are free, two page transfers, one for the page out and one for the page in, are required. This situation effectively doubles the page fault service time and increases the effective access time accordingly. We can reduce this overhead by using a modify bit. When this scheme is used, each frame or page has a modify bit associated with it in hardware. The modify bit for a page is set by the hardware whenever any byte in the page is written to indicating that the page has been modified. When we select a page for replacement, we can examine its modified bit. If the bit is set, we know that the page has been modified since it was read in from secondary storage. In this case, we have to write that page back to storage. If the modified bit is not set, the page has not been modified since it was read into memory. In this case, we do not need to write the memory page back to storage. It's already there. This technique also applies to read-only pages. Such pages cannot be modified. Therefore, they may be discarded when desired. This scheme can significantly reduce the time required to service a page fault since it reduces I.O. time by one half if the page has not been modified. Page replacement is basic to demand paging. It completes the separation between logical memory and physical memory. With this mechanism, a very large virtual memory can be provided for programmers on a much smaller physical memory. With no demand paging, logical addresses are mapped into physical addresses and all the pages of a process still must be in physical memory. With demand paging, the size of the logical express space is no longer constrained by physical memory. If we have a process of 20 pages, we can execute it in 10 frames 
simply by using demand paging and using some replacement algorithm to find a free frame whenever necessary. If a page that has been modified is to be replaced, its contents must be copied back to secondary storage. A later reference to that page will cause a page fault. At that time, the page will be brought back into memory, perhaps replacing some other page in the process. We must solve two major problems to implement demand paging. We must develop a frame allocation algorithm and a page replacement algorithm. That is, if we have multiple processes in memory, we must decide how many frames to allocate to each of those processes. And when a page replacement is required, we must select the frames that are to be replaced. Even slight improvements in demand pagement methods yield large gains in system performance. There are many different page replacement algorithms, so how do we select a replacement algorithm? In general, we want the one with the lowest page fault. And maybe in the next lesson, we will find it. So let's stop right here, go back and review your notes, update your study guide, and when you're ready, come on back for lesson four.